What does it mean to be asexual? How does it make you different from others? How do you even know that you are asexual? And if you are, what does that mean for you? These are some questions that the novel Loveless addresses. Written by Alice Oseman, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, who has earned quite a reputation for herself for writing some very good young adult books with queer characters, Heartstopper comes to mind with its own Netflix show, Loveless tells the story of Georgia, a young woman that has always loved love. Her parents have a ridiculously sappy story of how they met and fell in love, she has always been surrounded by good relationships, and she absolutely adores fanfiction, particularly the ones with characters getting into relationships with one another. But, cue the record scratch, she has never been in love. She has never wanted to sleep with anyone, never wanted to gaze into someone's eyes meaningfully on a beach, never even wanted to kiss anyone. And as all of us enlightened queer people know, that means she's arrow ace, both asexual and aromantic. She doesn't desire any sexual relationships with people or any romantic relationships. She's just built different. And that's okay. First, I want to say that this is a very, very good book. It's easy to read, the characters are endearing, and most importantly, it's interesting. But a quick caveat, this isn't necessarily a book about an arrow ace person. It's a book about an arrow ace person discovering, through some painful moments, that she is arrow ace, and why that's not a problem. Not a big difference, but I figure it's worth pointing out that maybe half of the book has Georgia just scratching her head and trying to make square pegs fit into round holes. Hey, before I go any further, I just want to ask you to please like this video if you, in fact, like it. Wow, that sounds silly. Anyways, the likes really help me know what topics people are most interested in, so I know what type of videos to focus on. That said, if there's a topic you'd like to see me cover, please feel free to leave a comment down below. Now, back to our topic. Loveless starts with Georgia at the very end of high school, at an after-prom party. We're introduced to her super-duper best friends, Pip and Jason, and it's clear from the get-go that these three people intensely care about one another. We are also introduced to Tommy, a popular boy that Georgia has had a quote-unquote crush on for seven years. Of course, it turns out the crush was fake. In middle school, a girl had held up a picture of a group of boys and asked Georgia who she thought was most handsome. She picked Tommy because he seemed the most conventionally attractive, and it was just decided at that moment that Georgia liked him. So she kept up the crush lie in her head which is a very child thing to do, and a very closeted asexual thing to do. This part of the book, where Georgia finally gets a chance to kiss Tommy, a person she has barely ever spoken to, and she is disgusted at the thought of kissing him and pushes him away, realizing that she never really liked him, this part here made me fall in love with Loveless, because I kind of went through something similar. Cut to Shaggy's story time. To preface this, I am not like Georgia. I'm not aromantic, and while I am somewhere on the asexuality spectrum, I do desire sexual relationships. Sometimes. Maybe. At one point in the book, asexuality is even described as less of a spectrum and more of a three-dimensional graph. And boy, does that make sense to me. I am definitely not willing to have sex with just anyone, but I also do not necessarily have to be in a romantic relationship with a person either to want to do something sexual with them, and my idea of attraction tends to be very different from others. It's confusing. So I'm somewhere on the asexuality graph, but haven't entirely figured out where. Anyways, back to story time, in middle school, I actually had a very similar experience to Georgia's. 
I was sitting with some friends and the topic of crushes came up. For reasons I am unclear about now, but which I assume came down to wanting to fit in, I said that I liked someone. I picked a girl I knew from some of my classes that I did think was pretty cool, even though I wasn't good friends with her, and I decided, yes, I have a crush on her. You want to know the craziest part? I didn't even tell my friends who it was. I could have lied and said that I liked someone and stopped there. But no, I had to actually pick someone and tell myself that I liked her. Weird, right? Looking back, I can't say why I did that. Thankfully, there was no heartbreak attached to it. I never confessed to her. I never even thought about it. And eventually, the whole thing just disappeared. Prior to that experience, I'd had tiny things happen. For some reason, I remember having a girlfriend in kindergarten, which was no doubt completely meaningless. But I don't think I'd ever had an actual crush on someone. And that changed later in middle school, and very much so in high school. But even then, my crushes felt like something different than what most people have. They were tied to affection, particularly receiving it from someone else, and were more about being loved or appreciated or even just liked by another person. So I kind of had crushes on people that were nice to me. But I can talk more about that stuff in a different video. Getting back on track, after realizing that she didn't really like Tommy, Georgia goes on a kind of search to try to make herself find love or feel something she thinks she's supposed to, but nothing works. She never wants to get physically close to anyone. She never wants to eat spaghetti and chew on the same piece, like in Lady and the Trap. She never wants to snoo-snoo anyone. <gasps> Finally, after some rather personal questions from her roommate, all for the sake of understanding Georgia's preferences and not just to be creepy, let's be clear, Georgia realizes that she is different from most other people. She doesn't think about sex all the time, or even at all. She doesn't feel a flutter in her chest when looking at anybody, and she never has. Those things, she thought they'd happen when she came across the right person, but it turns out, for a lot of people, those things just happen all on their own, and she's been missing out. At least... That's how she sees things. Georgia does kind of grieve for the future filled with romance she had always envisioned, and that makes sense. She thought her life would go one way, and it turns out it's not only going to go in a different direction, it's going to go in the opposite direction, as far from her idealized future as it can get. And that sounds pretty crappy for asexuals and aromantics. But the truth is, this grieving happens to Georgia because she didn't know that being asexual or aromantic was a thing. She just assumed that everyone eventually fell in love. And thanks to books like Loveless, more people can learn that life isn't that simple. Different identities exist, and they are what people truly are. They're not just something people create. And that topic is actually mentioned in the book in the thankfully small character of the former president of a queer student club, more on that in a minute, who is a gay man that bemoans the existence of pretty much every identity that isn't gay, bi, or trans. This is a character you really want to slap because his views actively hurt the main character of the book you're reading. But we see that he's wrong because everybody else in the book says he's wrong. And a jerk. Georgia comes to terms with who she is, with how her mind and body work, and how to find happiness, not despite her differences, but because of them. In the end, because she doesn't worry about who she wants to bone or who wants to bone her, or whether someone across the room fancies her back, she's able to focus more on the people and things she cares about which she definitely does towards the end of the book. Being asexual and or aromantic isn't a superpower, 
but it's not a detriment either. It's all in how you live. Now, the asexuality and aromanticism present in Loveless is the far side of the spectrum. Georgia has no desire whatsoever to have any sexual relations with anybody. Even kissing on the lips grosses her out, and she doesn't feel anything resembling romantic attraction to any person she has ever met. Which is true for a lot of people. But it's also true that there are asexuals and aromantics that are in other places, with varying degrees of comfort regarding sex and romance. And the book does acknowledge this, thankfully. At university, Georgia joins a queer student club and befriends the president, Sunil, who is a non-binary, homoromantic asexual. Lots of representation in that description. I like that. Sunil not only shows us another side of asexuality, but also serves as a source of knowledge for Georgia, letting her know that there are all types of people and all kinds of labels if a person desires them. This, of course, also informs the reader, in case they didn't know this stuff, which I bet will be the case for a fair number of readers. I love this type of book for that reason. It describes an identity that doesn't get a lot of representation, and does so in a way that is both informative and interesting. We care about Georgia as a character before we get any labels, which allows us to then better comprehend the labels, in case we haven't heard of them before, as well as remove prejudice, if there is any, because how could anyone that enjoys Georgia as a character dislike her because of something she cannot control that she is struggling to come to terms with? The book can't address, let alone answer, every query regarding asexuality and aromanticism, but it does a fantastic job with the ones it does address. Most importantly, what is there for an error ace person when they realize they don't want those kinds of relationships? What future do they have to look forward to when that future doesn't include children or a spouse, things we're often told are the most important things in life? Well, they have happiness to look forward to. Because happiness doesn't require being married, or even being in a romantic relationship. Happiness doesn't require having children. It just needs a person doing what they want with their life, accomplishing things that make them feel good with people that love and support them. We are social creatures. We need other people. But we don't have to bang them. We don't have to say, we're partners. We have this kind of relationship. Friendship matters. Family matters. And we can choose our family in addition to our blood relatives. I don't want to completely spoil the book, but at the end of the day, Georgia has people she can fall asleep next to, no romantic feelings involved. She has shoulders to cry on, arms that will gladly wrap around her, friends and family that will listen to her, appreciate her, and love her. She can have everything she wants out of life. And she doesn't have to have the things she doesn't. In this case, sex and romance with another person. She's not worse off for being asexual and aromantic. She's just different. Now, I would be remiss if I did not mention that this book also features a lesbian character, as well as a pansexual character, and several other queer identities. And a person that really, really loves Scooby-Doo. That's not a queer identity, but I don't know. Maybe it should be? Scooby's cool. Alice Oseman seems to be a great source for queer representation. Hopefully her other books are as good and helpful as this one. I'm definitely going to check them out at some point, and I'll let you know what I think when I do. If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching. I've been Shaggy. You can find me on Twitter and Patreon, Shaggy Jeebus on both. I've been trying to think of things to put on Patreon to make it worth joining, but it's kind of hard. So if you got any ideas, please let me know. Whatever you'd like to see behind the scenes, I guess. Until next time, stay gold, pony boy. Stay gold.